If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain how I found out about this. It's free. It's on your app store. There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right now from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Please, I urge you, don't waste another minute. I wasted three years. I attended all kinds of events to learn all the steps. I was so confused and it was right here. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Do it now. Happy Sunday, April 11, 2021 for the Heart and Home Podcast. I'm your host, Sabah Curry. Well, it's Sunday, a family day. It's also a reflection day for me. I hope you're having a wonderful day. As I mentioned in our podcast yesterday, I was going to talk about post-pandemic dreams. Now you're probably wondering what that's all about. Who's dreaming about what? And is this pandemic really over? No, but we can dream a little bit. There was an article um, that asked people, you know, what were their dreams? And even though we're slowly, I mean, those of us that have our vaccines, we're thinking things are going to go to normal. And although that there's cases of infection that are rising, your life might not be perfect right now, but look it, it's going to happen. We're hoping by summer. If everybody cooperates, get the vaccines, then they'll get the children vaccinated. Hopefully, um, just if everybody just does their part, we can beat this. It's not going to be perfect, but there were a few people that were dreaming And I hope that you are too. So in response to this article, when they asked people what their plans were, one person said, oh, once it's safe, you know, quote, I ache, want, yearn to have friends to share dinner with me around my dinner table. Cooking is a favorite activity. To share is friendship, warmth, togetherness. As for myself, being vaccinated and others as well. Perhaps this will soon become a reality. End quote. Another person responded, quote, What am I dreaming about post-pandemic? Question mark. I'm dreaming of smiles, full smiles with lips and teeth showing, not just from your eyes our eyes. I'm dreaming of hugs, the kind that envelope you, that stay with you as a gift. And I am dreaming of singing with others in person, in rehearsal, in public, not just virtually. My dreams sound so simple, so ordinary, but smiles, hugs, and singing are part of our human experience that pandemic-induced masks, social distancing, and isolating have taken away from us for a while. Their absence has taught me how precious they are in their ordinariness. End quote. And one person responded anonymously. They said, quote, oh, to be on the road again, up the Pacific coast, out through the desert, along I-15, all the way to Canada. Or dream of dreams across the land to the coast of Maine, end quote. Well, I hope that you do have dreams and that you didn't put them on hold. Now, I know during this downtime, a lot of people got busy. You might have gotten a lot accomplished. 
I know I read a lot of books. I got a lot of things done that I always complained I never had enough time. So I wanted to revisit. And for me, I wanted to look at my life and share that with you so that you would do the same. Now, I've mentioned that I love to write. I remember when I was in the fifth grade, standing before my class, giving a book report, and I decided I wanted to be a children's author one day. I have no idea why that idea popped into my head. It hasn't left my mind all my life. I have yet to realize that goal, but I know I will. I've set myself up for it. Look at I don't know what you did with your stimulus money, but I have a new monitor, a new mini Mac. I have the software program Readsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y dot com. I've set it up on both my desktop and my iPhone. I've already imported portions of my writing and put it into an outline. I've even rearranged my chapters. It's so easy when you have a system. If you're having trouble getting organized and want to put it in all your scribbled notes into one place, try Readsy. It's free. You'll be happy you did. Or you can just go on and struggle to figure out how to publish on Amazon or go to the traditional publisher route or go the self-publish route. Now, as I've mentioned, I've been working on a book called Interruptive Journalism. I also am writing other books simultaneously regarding Rose, which is my experience as a caregiver to my parents. One day, I hope to write a memoir. A memoir, you say? Well, it's a version of your stories as you remember them. Kind of like Meghan Markle's interview with Oprah. You know, in the beginning, how... uh, Before Oprah started the interview, she mentions, like, this is your version of a story that you want to tell. And while the palace retorted that recollections may differ, each person, whether famous or not, should consider sharing their life experiences through stories. After all, that's what we pass down to the next generation. Another fond memory that I have when I was a child is my mom used to record our children's stories on a reel-to-reel. And I would look at that machine and I was so amazed by the voice that came out of this machine. And perhaps that's why I just love recording. When I was in junior high, it was like when I was in my teens, like before I started driving and working, I would sit with a radio in my in my room and I would actually make cassette tapes of my favorite songs on the radio. And I don't, not everybody knows what cassette tapes are, but those are things that use tape and you play them in a machine and yeah, yeah, okay, I'm dating myself. Um, I gave all of those to a friend who really relished having them. I spent days, weeks, months, many hours preparing them. And to me, I just knew that I loved the radio, music. I loved being a DJ or pretending that I was. And then I ended up one day going actually to broadcasting school. I had wanted to do it after high school, but I never got a chance to. But Throughout my career, I just left my corporate job one day and I said, you know what, I'm going to go to night school and I'm going to enroll. And I did. And I spent a year in the evenings and I actually pursued my dream. You know, we have a lot of dreams inside of us and a lot of us, we don't listen to those, those little It's like a nagging voice that says, oh, you should do this and oh, you should do that. And, you know, like, oh, you should write a book and oh, you should go and do this. And most of us just ignore those. And and I wish that we can revisit that now. If anything, this past year has taught me is how short life is if we didn't already know that and how lucky we are to be alive and how, you know what? Let's just do it, okay? Let's just reset and just go and do 
what it is that we really should be doing and what we want to do. Not just doing this because we have to or doing things that we really don't want to. Okay, so you might not write a memoir and you might not think that you should write a memoir. You know, you might think that that's just for famous people, but no, a lot of people write them. I mean, I have a friend who went to Columbia um, uh, in, in New York and after he got his degree, he came out and he spent several years writing a memoir. He had no plans to do anything with it, but he just felt the need to do it. Now, maybe that wasn't the right time to do it. Maybe he didn't have that much to say. I'm not saying that you're going to be famous from it, but writing down your thoughts and sharing your stories and your experiences are very helpful to other people who might have gone through something that you might be going through. So I hope you'll consider it one day. So as I mentioned, a memoir, you know, it's your stories. They don't have to be linear, unlike an autobiography. They don't have to be detailed over time. The term comes from the French word memoir, which means memory or reminiscence. An example of a memoir is Becoming by Michelle Obama. And you can listen to episode 20 of the Heart and Home uh, podcast. I talked about that book on February 12, 2020. Another example that most of you might have already heard of, which became a movie, is Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. Now, as I mentioned, memoirs differ from an autobiography. They allowed the author to explore a pivotal moment or a part of your life. For example, my book regarding Rose covers the period of my life while caring for my mom and dad. It focuses on the golden years of a person's life and it's a wake-up call to the reader to take control of your life while you still have time left. Although no one knows how much time you really have, it is a mindset of living each day to the fullest. If you're like many people, you might realize that your days merge into weeks and then years and you wake up one morning and ask, where have the last 10, 20, or 30 years gone? It happens. When you're young, you're looking ahead at turning 16 so you could drive. You want to be 21. When you're the legal age, then you're looking forward to being 30 and then 40 or even 50 years old. And you mark these milestones. And I know a lot of people that celebrate these milestones. It's normal. Uh, but then you're staring time down a barrel. Suddenly you find yourself in your 60s and you wonder, what you're going to do with your life. Now that's something you should have figured out in your teens or tweens or 20s or 30s or some for 40s. Some it might take us for a while. You choose your future by gaining an education, raising a family, or pursuing a career. Some do both. The balance between family time and work time become blurred. You find yourself doing tasks you really don't enjoy or don't want to do. Yet, you do them because it's what's expected of you. But you shouldn't let others dictate your life and how you live it. And how you spend your time is your choice. You see, you choose to accept a job, the hours, the responsibility, the pay. You get yourself locked into a job thinking that's security but you learn nothing in life is guaranteed. Jobs are no longer p plentiful. Money doesn't grow on trees and your perfect mate never arrives on that white horse. You're not the main character in your Cinderella story. No Prince Charming is going to save you. After all, we're not all going to grow up to marry a prince like Diana or Meghan. Life is not always perfect but learn from it. Write it down. Remember it. This is this too shall pass, whether you're going through a bad spell or not. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people keep diaries. Uh, Oprah has kept diaries for years. The Queen of England also keeps a diary. A lot of people are very disciplined and they keep a diary. Either they write in it in the morning or at night. Um, but 
I'm kind of like the kind of person that just writes whenever and, you know, whenever it strikes me and my notes are all over the place and I am so fragmented, I have nothing organized. So don't worry if you don't got it together. Hey, you'll get it together someday. Well, that someday is today. Getting yourself unstuck from an unhappy job, a marriage, a situation takes courage. You have that inside of you. If you are true to yourself, then you'll come to the conclusion that you're the main character in your story. So don't let others dictate your life. You have dreams and aspirations. They might not include writing a memoir or an autobiography. You might not even think you're a good writer, or perhaps you're eyesight isn't that good. Well, here's some advice I shared with my aunt in a similar situation. When I presented her with a beautifully bound diary to write her life stories, she hesitated. She didn't think she could do it. In fact, she didn't know how. So I showed her the voice memos app on her iPhone, and I told her she could talk into her phone and tell a story as if she were sitting at a table talking to a friend. And that way, she doesn't need to worry about sentence structure, grammar, an outline, or a plot. Her characters would come out in her stories. While having lunch one day, my aunt shared a story about something that had happened with her brother. He had shut the door in her face and wouldn't allow her to visit him at his home. The reason? She had changed her religion and decided to become a Christian. She'd been raised in a Muslim family, immigrated from a village in the southern Lebanon, married a Catholic, and she was suddenly seen by her brother as an enemy. Now, things happen in families that cause us not to talk to certain siblings or relatives, perhaps because we feel they're toxic or we don't agree with their lifestyle. It could be they are using drugs or abusing alcohol, things that you disapprove of. <clears throat> you may have felt betrayed by a family member who may have mistreated you, taken advantage of you, or belittles you. Whatever the reason, relationship and communication is broken due to irre irreconcilable differences. Perhaps your family disowns you because they didn't like your choice of a marriage partner. That's another common issue within some families. The issues are not new, but to you, experiencing something you feel alone, helpless, shut out from the world. That's why sharing your stories is so important. By telling others, you free yourself and help someone going through the same thing. There's value in your story and in your life. If you're not pursuing the route of being a published book author, I include a link in the show notes of an interview conducted by a YouTuber and Texas news anchor, Dominique Saxe, with a TV news agent, Ken Lindler, in Los Angeles. He's just released a new book entitled Career Choreography that includes 35 years of experience to guide you to your dream job. Now, when I was growing up, I read, I think it's called What Color Is Your Parachute? And what I learned from that book was to choose the company you want to work for and apply to them and go to the city to where you want to live. And that's actually what I did. I packed up my car. My, my sister thought I was crazy. She's like, you don't have a job. I said, I'll get one when I get there. She's like, you don't know anybody. I said, well, I, I know some people. And I didn't even worry about it. I wasn't even scared. I just got in the car, drove to D.C., knocked on doors, got a job, and that was it. Now, I know it's not as easy now as it used to be, but there are people out there that have good advice that can help you. And I was really um, uh, impressed by this person uh, who Dominique had helped, uh, said had helped her in her career, and she had been friends with him. And he has a very good a compelling story as well. So what he explains is that this is a perfect opportunity for those who've lost their job during COVID-19. And perhaps you're re-entering the workforce. Maybe you were raising your children or a new, you could be a college graduate. There's stiff competition out there. So 
um, Ken Lindner. It's L-I-N-D-N-E-R. He says, your experience gives you an edge over other applicants. He also says for those women in their prime, not to focus on the younger generation who are more higher able because they're cheaper. So, you know, there is a trend for employers to want to hire younger people because they don't have to pay them as much. And they look at your resume and they think, oh, she has a master's and oh, she's not going to take any anything lower than a certain, you know, uh, salary or something like that. So they automatically might exclude you. Now, as you get up in age, once you get past the 40, 40-ish, employers pretty much pass you up. And I've experienced that. It's called ageism. Um, and it's unfortunate because they don't understand your value. It's not just because they don't want to pay you. Even if you're willing to accept a job for less, they think, oh, no, you're not going to be happy. You won't stay. They've already got their mind made up. They don't think that you're hungry enough and they'd rather give it to some young person, bright eyed and bushy tailed straight out of college. So you have to be able to convince a prospective employer that your experience is more valuable than some young person just out of college. So what Ken says is to focus on what um, you live and what you're good at, what you love, excuse me, and what you're good at. His own father reinvented himself after getting laid off at the age of 66. Now, he did say it took him three years before he landed a dream job training buyers for a new startup called TJ Maxx, where he worked for the next 30 years. Now, you might not plan to work until you're 99, but it proves there is hope and that you're never too old. I know not everybody works that long and a lot of people are just looking forward to retirement. Um, But some of us enjoy work. We want to work. We want to keep busy. We want to keep active. And those that retire, actually, you end up doing other things, like things that you love. That's why we have so many authors over the age of 60 that once they retire, then they go and do what they love. And so they spend the next 30 years in their 60s, 70s, and 80s writing or doing things that they like, like traveling, raising their grandkids, whatever. Okay, so one example that I love to share is how Louise Hay started Hay House Publishing when she was in her 60s. So don't rule out entrepreneurship as well. If you go the corporate route, he says, don't worry about the money. If you're good at what you do, the money will come. So right now, good jobs are hard to come because of the pandemic. So if you're looking for a certain salary, consider what he did out of college. He took a job that paid 50% less of another job offer because he believed in the company and the work he would be doing. I've done the same thing and never looked back. And and he tells you the details about what happened in the interview that I've linked in the in the um, show notes. And, and, you know, instead of making big bucks working in my last career as a legal secretary, I took a part time job that included my area of education, my background and something I had never considered before working for a nonprofit. Now, I, too, was laid off in March 2020. I accepted it. My previous employer has yet to reopen, but last week I received an email from my old boss that they were looking to hire a few to work remotely. Now, those involve different skills, which I'm confident I am qualified. So if you're not on Zoom, make sure you get a free account. Most likely, that's how you will be interviewed. Okay, next. Now, you might be wondering, gosh... I really don't know what I want to do. I mean, how do I know what my purpose is? And I've mentioned before on my podcast of the Heart and Home, I've said, you know, your purpose is what you're doing right now. And I remember when I talked about 
uh, Tony Robbins, which was on uh, Jamie Kern um, uh, Lima, when uh, her book came out, uh, Believe It. Tony Robbins also stated that your purpose changes throughout your life and you could have several purposes. So don't think you just have one purpose, okay? But if you want to try to find that out and you're not sure, there's something you might want to try. Now, you might say, well, I don't know what my purpose is. Well, your purpose is what you were put on this earth to do or what, what your unique gifts are. And like I said, you might want to try something new this week. Uh, Reed Tracy, the CEO of Hay House, sent out an email to those on his mailing list suggesting we join Hay House for a free showing of Wayne Dyer's course called Manifest Your Soul's Purpose. The course is another way to open yourself up to spring's new beginnings. Now, Reed shares that one thing Wayne Dyer taught him is that the truth of who you are is more amazing than you could ever imagine. Imagine that. Wayne says, you are light, love, beauty, wonder, and like everything in this world, you have a unique essential purpose. One of uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer's 10 secrets for success and inner peace is, quote, don't die with your music still in you. I've heard this so many times. I know Les Brown mentions it, um, and I'm sure other people quote it, and they might know not know that this is from Wayne Dyer, or maybe others say it, but listen. Listen to it. Okay, listen to the music inside of you. Listen to those little whispers. So right before Wayne passed away, six years ago, Hay House recorded this online course with him uh, called Manifest Your Soul's Purpose. It helps you understand how to follow your inner calling and share what your soul is here to do. All the teachings are still relevant today. It's a seven-part course. They normally charge $4.99, but it's free this week, beginning on Tuesday, April 13, through Monday, April 19. So how it works with Hay House is each day they release a new lesson, um, and then you get to listen to it, and then it goes away, and then the next day they release another lesson. Um, now the lesson titles that they have coming up, which if you sign up through the hayhouse.com app, um, you'll see that lesson number one is to tap into the infinite intelligence within you. That's 40 minutes long. Lesson two, become one with the creative source of everything. That's 57 minutes long. Lesson three, fear versus love with Anita Morjani. That's 55 minutes long. And I'm going to play you a, a clip uh, at the end of this broadcast with Anita. Uh, lesson four, uh, divine love knows no judgment. And that's 63 and a half minutes. Lesson five, the incredible lightness of being, 60 minutes. Lesson six, the healing power of forgiveness with Immaculee Ilibagiza and Scarlett Lewis. That's a little over an hour. And lesson seven, become a being of light, Wayne Dyer's last recorded lecture, 78 minutes. So it's about an hour a day. If you don't have the time right now, or if you miss it, you may purchase the course at the link in the show notes. So, this course also includes Wayne, like I said, talking with Anita Murjani, the author of Dying to Be Me. It's a journey from cancer to near death to true healing. If you haven't heard of her yet, um, I urge you to look into it. I actually got to meet Anita and her husband, and uh, she's still alive and well. Um, she, now, Wayne also talks to Immaculee uh, Ilabagiza, the author of Left to Tell, 
Discovering God Amidst the Rwanda Holocaust. And if Anita's story isn't compelling enough for you of a person who was given her last rites, who was in a coma and had already crossed over and then goes and meets her father who had passed away 10 years earlier and he encourages her to come back into her body and live out her life, then, oh my God, Immaculee's story is I can't even explain to you what she went through. But that one you have to know about. And both of these women, Wayne had discovered, brought to Hay House, and they were able to publish their stories. And they had toured with him and been on stage with him. And that's how we got to know them, because Wayne heard about them and brought them to Hay House. I had the pleasure of seeing Wayne on his many PBS TV specials. Uh, anyone that knows anything about Wayne Dyer knows he's from Detroit. He attended Wayne State before moving to New York and actually walking away from a tenured position and decided to travel the country and sell his books from his trunk. But when I met him in person, I was blown away by his compassion. Um, Hay House had sent out a note saying that Wayne was coming to Detroit, and it was at Cobo Hall, which has been re, uh, renamed now. But it was in downtown Detroit, and I was working in Troy, which is in the suburbs. It was about about 45 minutes away outside of the downtown Detroit. So I made arrangements to buy a ticket. I asked work if I could leave early, and I got downtown, parked my car, got into the Cobo Hall, and we were overlooking the Detroit River. There were beautiful windows, and I don't know, maybe there were about 2,000 people in the, in the room. And then eventually Wayne shows up, and his brother was with him and other members of his family. I can't remember if his mom was there or not, because I know she's since passed as well, Um. And I know he his daughter was with him, Sky. He always had his daughter who would sing. So the minute that Wayne came into the room, everybody crowded around him. And he was just cool with it, you know, hello, greeting everybody. Then finally he makes his way to the stage and then he gets on and he talks. And then afterwards, you're allowed to make a purchase in the back of the room uh, of his books. And then he would sign them for you. And we would all lined up and we were waiting for Wayne to sign our books. Well, Wayne was, you know, was on a schedule and he said, you know, he needed to leave by a certain time. Do you know he did not leave until every person's book was signed? He stayed, I, I don't know, it could have been like two hours, three hours. I can't even remember. It was longer than what he talked and we were there. We were hanging out. Just It was like a big party. He wasn't scared about the time. He didn't care. He was there. He was hanging out. He was cool. It, I mean, it was like, wow. I have never met that with any other author. And I've been to a lot of other events where other authors show up. They go, here, here's your time. They have somebody that says, sit down. They take your picture. They sign it. You're in, you're out, that's it. You don't get to talk. I mean, when I met Anita, it was at a weekend conference. So I had time to talk with her. She had more time. She had more of a flexible schedule. I was working with the staff that was putting on the conference. So it wasn't as rigid as many others. Like um, if you don't get to know these people and if you aren't around them in their circles, then you don't have that much access to them. Oh, anyways, I have so much to say. And I actually got a wonderful picture of Anita and her husband, Danny. Um, and when I met them in Chicago several years ago, and then I have the most beautiful picture of uh, Wayne Dyer when I met him in Detroit. And besides loving books and reading and writing, I'm also an avid photographer. So having those photos are um, very precious to me. I wanted to share that with you, and in the meantime, 
I've included a link to a video in the show notes featuring Wayne and Anita Merjani. Um, in this video, they reveal the profound changes you can expect in your personal evolution towards living a purposeful, purpose-filled life or becoming what Wayne refers to as a being of light. Um, next weekend on the Heart and Home podcast, I'll be covering Martha Beck's new book, The Way of Integrity, Finding the Path to Your True Self. It drops Tuesday, on uh, April 13th. As you reflect on your life, I want you to dream bigger than you have before, because if you've lost a job or a role, you realize that labels don't define who you are. You're more than just a cashier, a waitress, a nurse, a technician, a secretary. You're capable of being much more. Now, those titles and roles put you in a box. I want you to break out of your box. See what's possible. See what's inside your heart that you keep ignoring. Find your inner voice that's been speaking to you all these years. Talk to you next weekend. Have a great week. Anita, you, your father said live your life fearlessly. Do you think most people are just uh, so consumed with fears that, uh, that they're unable to see their own magnificence and uh, what they can, you know, what they're here for? Um, when you were there, um, and how are you doing that now? I mean, uh, you, you, you've been cancer-free now for, what, uh, six, for nine years? Nine years. Aren't you afraid that it's going to come back? No, I don't even think about it. Mm. I'm too busy focused on joy and having fun. Mm. I don't even think about the cancer coming back. And, and yes, I, I used to live my life out of fear before. And I think most people do. And it's something we do unconsciously without even thinking about it. I didn't realize I was living my life out of fear until I had the experience mm. in the other realm. So fear isn't just, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to fall off this cliff or, or, you know, I'm afraid of the boogeyman or something. Fear is just sort of a, almost a way of living, isn't it? It's, it keeps people out of the light, doesn't it? Yes, fear is a way of living. Um, How did you use fear? What, what kinds of fears did you have? I was afraid of uh, everything. I was afraid of displeasing people. I was afraid of eating the wrong foods. I was obsessive about taking supplements to prevent cancer even before I got cancer. Mm. I was afraid of just about everything, even um, afraid of not making enough money, afraid of not succeeding, afraid of being disliked. Mm. It was just about everything. A lot of people say to me, but fear keeps us safe. Mm. And I say, no, love keeps us mm. safe, not fear. Yeah. Fear immobilizes us. But whereas if you love yourself and you love the people around you and you love and value your life, mm. you will do things that only enhance it. But how can you love yourself if things aren't going well or if, that, if uh, you know, if uh, you know, you're living in poverty or if someone close to you is sick or whatever? What is this business about loving ourselves? In fact, loving ourselves means valuing ourselves and being our own best friend. And I think that if we don't love ourselves, we're less likely to attract money and attract mm -hmm. good things into our lives. Mm -hmm. We tend to think that it's our negative thoughts that um, attract negative right. things. But it's actually the lack of value and love we have for ourselves. We tend to then push away or feel that we're not deserving or worthy of positive mm -hmm. things including money and health and so on. Mm -hmm. I realize that the more I love myself, in fact, I tell people, love yourself like your life depends on it, because it does. Mm -hmm. The more I love myself, the more I attract positive things, including health mm -hmm. and, and good things in life.